Hello and welcome to this webinar on skin sensitization, which is co-sponsored with Peter International Science Consortium. I'm Andrew Turley, Science Editor at Chemical Watch, and I'll be moderating the event. Introducing the speakers today will be Dr. Christopher Fassbender, an advisor to the Peter International Science Consortium. Before I hand over to him, I will run through the format of today's webinar. Today we have two speakers who will each present for about 25 minutes. Then we'll go into a short Q&A uh, session to answer any questions you might have raised during the talks. If you experience any technical problems during the webinar, you can also use the question box to send a query to my colleague Glenn, who should be able to assist. Delegates should also know that a recording of this webinar, along with all the slides, will be available on the Chemical Watch and the Peter International Science Consortium websites in the next few days. Now, let me hand over to Christopher, who will provide some information on this webinar series and introduce you to the speakers. Thank you, Andrew. I'd like to welcome all the participants to today's webinar on behalf of the Peter International Science Consortium and to thank Chemical Watch for their support in hosting these webinars. The Peter International Science Consortium is an organization that promotes reliable and relevant regulatory testing approaches that protect human health and the environment while eliminating the use of animals. This series updates the popular 2014 and 2015 webinar series. It includes both live and recorded webinars and reflects the significant progress in the use and acceptance of non-animal methods that has occurred in recent years. Around a million animals have already been used for REACH purposes, yet there are provisions within REACH to minimize animal testing. For Annexes 7 and 8 in particular, there are excellent alternative methods that can be used to meet REACH data requirements. It is with this in mind that the Science Consortium has made minimizing animal testing for REACH requirements a high priority. If you check out our website, you will see that we have a page dedicated to promoting alternative methods to meet REACH requirements. Also on our website, we will provide recordings of all webinars in this series. I'd also like to let you know that our scientists are available to assist registrants in avoiding animal testing, so please feel free to get in touch with us if you need advice on how to use the alternative methods discussed during these webinars. Today, we will be presenting the second live webinar in this series, which is focused on alternative methods for skin sensitization testing. The other live webinars in this series address specific Annex 7 and 8 endpoints, including serious eye damage and irritation and skin irritation and corrosion. These webinars are of interest to industry toxicologists, those registering chemicals, reach consultants and companies who would like to know more about validated non-animal tests and how companies are using them. Importantly, I'd like to draw your attention to two recorded webinars that are available on the Science Consortium and Chemical Watch websites. The first recorded webinar gives perspectives on the development, evaluation and application of in silico approaches for predicting toxicity. This webinar is presented by leading experts in the field, Grace Patlovich from the US EPA and Mark Cronin from Liverpool John Moores University. The second recorded webinar is presented by Kimo Luwukari from ECA and discusses ways to avoid acute oral toxicity testing using weight of evidence approaches. I'll now introduce our speakers so they can present what I know will be a very informative presentation. Our speakers are Drs. Susanne Kolle and Silvia Casati. Dr. Kolle is a toxicologist at the Environmental Toxicology and Ecology Department at BASFSE. Dr. Kazati is Senior Scientific Officer at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. During the webinar, Dr. Kolle will introduce data requirements, including the 2016 update to reach Annex 7, and provide an overview of the key mechanisms of skin sensitization based on the published adverse outcome pathway. Dr. Kazati will describe the in vitro and in chemical methods that can be used to assess skin sensitization, with a specific focus on the validated and OECD adopted methods and on combining them in defined approaches. 
Dr. Kolle will provide examples of defined approaches to hazard identification and potency categorization. Dr. Kazati will close by reviewing current OECD activities in the field of skin sensitization. With that, I'll pass the controls over to Susanna to start. Good afternoon, and thanks, Andrew and Christopher, for your kind introduction. Um, good afternoon also to the audience. Um, and I'm really happy that we have this opportunity to update the webinar um, of a couple of years back. So um, to start with, um, I wanted to give you a very, very, very short uh, overview of sensitization. Um, so the clinical manifestation of what we call skin sensitization is actually the allergic contact dermatitis. Um, hy the hypersensitive reaction occurs after a repeat repeated contact uh, to an allergen, so a single exposure is not sufficient um, to, to actually induce um, this kind of reaction. And most, most importantly is um, that there is 15 to 20 percent of the general population is uh, sensitized um, to something. The most common contact, um, contact allergen is, is nickel, so that's included, for example, in, in jewelry. Um, so this is my background. If we go to the next slide, please. We uh, see the information requirements that were laid down in, in the old reach, so the non-revised annex. Um, so skin sensitization is one of the data points that is required. And uh, until recently, the local lymph node assay was the first choice method um, to, to cover that endpoint. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. We look at the um, update of, of the annex. Um, so in 2017, the REACH annex was um, updated and it now includes the in vitro and in chemical method, methods. Um, and it's actually the methods that uh, Silvia pr will present us a little later. So um, it's, it's methods that um, address the molecular initiating event, so the um, molecular interaction with skin proteins. We look at um, the activation of keratinocytes, so inflammatory responses. And the third event that is being addressed is the activation of dendritic cells. And um, so if we can address all these endpoints, no in vivo test needs to be conducted. Um, there's a however to, to that, and we will look in this a, a little further down the presentation. Um, there is a condition, if, for example, if one of the in vitro methods is not applicable or, or if um, for some reason, the results are not adequate for classification, and a NIVO test uh, may still need to be conducted. So, in the next slide, we will look at the uh, local lymph node assay just to uh, provide you with a brief background here. Um, so, it's an assay that is conducted on the mouth. It is the first in vivo method that was ever validated, um, and it has been regulatorily accepted for the assessment of hazard and potency. So it's addressing the question whether um, a test substance has the intrinsic property to cause sensitization, yes or no. And if it does so, um, it, it also quantifies the impact. Um, very briefly, um, in, in the essay using mice, um, we have at least um, three dose groups that are being assessed um, and, and the vehicle group as a control group. And then depending on your regulatory background, you may have to run a concurrent positive control or you do that um, periodically. A, a group of animals contains at least four animals. Um, many institutes use five for statistical reasons. Um, and then we have test substance concentrations applied on three consecutive days. Um, then the animals sit for, um, for a while. And then on the sixth day, we have the uh, tail vein injection of radiolabel thymidine. Um, to mark the proliferated lymph node cells, um, which are then removed, and by scintillation counting, those, those are quantified. And um, if we go on the next slide, um, we see the kind of information that can be um, retrieved from the local lymph node assay. Um, so we have potency information besides the yes, no answer. Um, and there's different ways to, to quantify that. Um, so the result we obtain is an EC three value for the sensitizers, and the lower the value, the more potent the sensitizer is. Um, and there's on, on the top end of the slide, you can see the um, ESITO criteria. Um, so that those are uh, five classes between extreme and non-sensitizer. 
um, but in the context of REACH, we're more interested in GHS, that's on the, on the bottom um, scale. And um, the most important value here is, is um, the EC3 value of 2% because that's distinguishing GHS categories 1A and 1B for, for the sensitizers. On the next slide, um, we will now see more of the mechanism of the, of, of the sensitization um, pathway um, to then walk into the, the AOP and um, then Sylvia will um, discuss the methods. So what you see here is a schematic uh, of, of the skin. Um, so the skin has different layers and um, there's certain events that need to take place um, such that the substance can be a sensitizer. So first of all, um, it needs to penetrate um, the skin. And we see that on the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so um, the uh, substance would uh, penetrate the skin uh, during a primary contact. And um, then we have the uh, skin cells um, that may exert some danger signal. So that's depicted by the yellow um, amongst around um, the cells. Um, and then in, um, in, in the next step, um, please on, on the next slide, um, you see that the dendritic cells, um, they migrate and they nature, um, and um, they also change their morphology by, by the uh, cell surface markers. Um, and with that, on the next slide, um, this is a, a very, very schematic scheme um, of the adverse outcome pathway um, that's breaking down the skin sensitization um, into several steps. So uh, first of all, we have the chemical structures and properties. Um, so if something is not um, reactive, it may need um, to be metabolized to actually be electrophilic. And as we've seen in the previous slide, and I forgot to mention, the molecular initiating event um, that's actually the binding of the substance to, to the protein. Um, then the next level would be the cellular responses, that's the dendritic cells and also the um, keratinocytes. And then in the, in the next level, looking at the organ response, that's the um, lymph nodes. And eventually, um, we're looking at the organism response, um, which is then closing the adverse outcome pathway. So all of these, um, or most of these individual steps of the adverse outcome pathway can be uh, addressed by in vitro methods. Um, and the developments and successes also led to an update of the REACH um, guidance on, on the uh, um, which we will see on the next slide. So um, in also in summer of last year, um, the endpoint specific guidance was updated. Um, it provides guidance how to fulfill the REACH requirements um, using different types of information. Um, so it also talks about um, existing methods and non-testing methods, and then includes a an, uh, general um, integrated testing strategy. And next slide, please. So um, with the REACH guidance and the update of the Annex, um, the in vitro methods uh, that are available as guidelines uh, now have to be used uh, for the assessment of skin sensitization. However, there are certain conditions um, where animal tests are still needed. So, if you, for example, if you have certain uh, limitations by the test substance, um, for example, if something is lipophilic or cannot be tested by, for, for technical reasons, um, you may still need to conduct the in vivo test. Um, also, if the in vitro results are not, um, yeah, they're not coming out very straightforward, and you have discordant results between individual assays that you may have to um, conduct the NEVO test. And uh, with this slide, I think I will hand over um, to Sylvia, who will now walk us uh, through the OECD and other adopted tests. Thank you, Susanna, and good afternoon to all of those who are listening to this webinar. So if you go to the next slide, I will now try to describe briefly the, the individual test methods, which are covered by three test guidelines, test guideline 442 C, D, and E. And this test guideline describes uh, six different test methods. I will describe each individual test method in quite some details. Uh, an interesting aspect of test guideline 442 D and D 
is that they represent the first example of, of key event-based test guidelines, where methods addressing a specific event within uh, the skin sensitization AOP are grouped into a single document. This approach, which was uh, uh, newly introduced by the OECD, is meant to facilitate tracing methods which uh, are addressing the same key events within the AOP. Next slide. Test guideline 442C described the direct peptide reactivity assay, which is an chemical assay, meaning that it's based purely on a chemical reaction and does not use its biological test system. The DIPRA is designed to cover the process of attenuation of the adverse outcome pathway. And uh, it's, it's measuring the reactivity of chemical towards synthetic peptides containing either lysine or cysteine. The procedure involves the incubation of the peptides and the chemical for 24 hours. And after this incubation period, the remaining concentration of three peptide is measured with HPLC. The average peptide depletion of cysteine and lysine is then used in a prediction model that allows to discriminate between reactive and non-reactive chemicals. In addition, the prediction model permits to assign chemical to one of four reactivity classes. The DIPRA does not have a metabolic competence system. Therefore, the so-called prohaptans, chemicals which are not uh, directly reactive, but needs to be transformed into a reactive species by enzymatic transformation, cannot be identified by the DIPRA. Next. Test guideline 442D uh, describes the keratinosense and the lucens, which are similar methods that are looking at responses in keratinocytes and specifically at the activation of the antioxidant electrophile response element dependent pathway which is an important pathway in the process of skin sensitization. And the primary mechanism which leads to the activation of this pathway is the modification of the KIP1 protein through covalent binding of the electrophilic chemicals. The keratinocytes and leucines are both based on the use of keratinocytes derived cell lines, which are transfected with a plasmid that contains the luciferase gene under the transcriptional control of an antioxidant response element. The activation of the pathway is measured by quantifying the luciferase gene induction with a light producing luciferase substrate. Cells are exposed at different concentrations of test chemical and after the incubation period, the luciferase fall induction is quantified by luminescence analysis. Cytotoxicity is also assessed in parallel to make sure that uh, the observed response is occurring at subtoxic concentration. A prediction is considered positive if the luciferase gene induction exceeds a given threshold in at least two independent experiments. Next slide. The next three test methods are described in test guideline 442E. This test guideline, test guideline groups methods that address mechanisms of activation of the dendritic cell. The human cell line activation cells, also known as HCLAT, and the U937 cell line activation test, known as USEMS, measure changes in the expression of the CD86 or the CD56 surface markers, as Susanne explained before. And these markers are known to play a critical role in the activation of monocytes and dendritic cells. These methods use a test system, as test system immortalized cell of human origin that are considered surrogate models for monocytes and dendritic cells. The changes of expression of the sulfane markers are measured by flow cytometry following cell staining, typically with Fitch-labeled antibodies. Cytotoxicity is also measured 
uh, with propidium iodide, and this is measured concurrently to assess whether upregulation of the cell surface markers occurs at subtoxic concentration. The relative fluorescence intensity of surface markers compared to the vehicle control are calculated and used in the prediction model to discriminate between positive and negative responses. Also in this case, at least two consistent independent experiments needs to be generated to support the discrimination between sensitizers and non-sensitizers. Next slide. These slides show the third method described in test guideline 442E, which is the interleukinate reported gene assay. And in contrast to the other two assays, which are analyzing the expression of cell surface markers, the interleukin 8 look assay quantifies, quantifies changes in the interleukinate expression a cytokine associated with the activation of the dendritic cells. In the THP1-derived interleukin-8 reporter cell line, the changes of interleukin-8 expression are measured indirectly via the activity of a luciferase gene <clears throat> under the control of the interleukin-8 promoter. The relative luminescence intensity of treated cells compared to solvent vehicle control are calculated and used in a prediction model to support the discrimination between positive and negative responses. Next. Well, that was a very high level overview of the individual test methods. Details on the use of these methods can be found in the respective test guidelines and protocols for the implementation of the methods can be found through the URL ECVAM database on alternative methods or on the website of the Japanese Center for the Validation of Alternative Methods. Given the fact that each test method is based on a specific chemical or biological mechanism, the test guidelines provide positive or negative prediction for that specific mechanism. So they cannot be used individually to conclude on the presence or absence of skin synthesization potential. Another aspect is that when data are generated with these methods, their domain of applicability should be considered. We have heard already from Susanne that, for example, highly lipo lipophilic chemicals cannot be tested due to solubility problems. Highly cytotoxic substances also interfere. And another aspect is the possible interference of test chemicals with the detection system. For example, out of fluorescent chemicals might be difficult to detect and to test. Also, some of these methods can in principle be applied for the testing of mixtures, but so far there is very limited experience with this. The test guidelines also prescribe that depending on the regulatory framework, positive results from the test methods may be used on their own to conclude on the presence of skin sensitization potential, whereas negative prediction needs to be considered together with other information in the context of integrated approaches to testing and assessment. And the same reasoning apply for classifying substances into the GHS subcategory 1A and 1B. Even if the test guideline provides quantitative information, this cannot be used on their own for subcategorization purposes. Next slide. It's one of the worries related with the use of these test methods concern their ability to predict chemicals that needs to be activated either abiotically or enzymatically. And these chemicals are called prehaptans and prohaptans. Uh, an analysis which was based on a relative large number of chemicals indicated that prehaptans are generally correctly predicted by all the test methods and that the cell-based assay are also able to detect the majority of the prohaptans. 
The only chemicals that fail to be correctly predicted by in vitro methods are the slow oxidizing agents, but they represent also a problem for the in vivo methods. Next slide, please. Besides the adopted methods, there are other two assays that it's worth uh, mentioning since these are under consideration by the OECD. The first one is called Senses. This is a test which uses a reconstituted human skin model and a quantitative PCR analysis for measuring the expression of 61 biomarkers. Positive chemicals are detected on the basis of the number of overexpressed genes. The method is also proposed for potency categorization. The potency is derived from the amount of test chemicals needed to induce a positive response compared to the epidermis treated with a vehicle only. Next slide. Another test method, which is based on gene expression, is the genomic allergen detection test, the GARD, which is proposed to help the discrimination between positive and negative chemicals. This method uses the MAS3 cells as a surrogate model for dendritic cells, and it monitors the expression of a large panel of genes called the GARD prediction signature, and it uses a support vector, vector machine model for the discrimination between positive and negative chemicals. The test methods was recently further developed and, potent, and the potential biomarker signature identified to predict three potencies classes. Next slide. Susanna already mentioned that uh, the European Chemicals Agency updated their guidance on information requirements to include also a testing and assessment strategy to fulfill the information requirements uh, under reach. And this uh, um, testing and assessment strategies is requesting that in first place, existing information and information from non-animal methods be used. In, uh, in parallel, activities have been undertaken to integrate different non-animal data generated, for example, with computational and chemical in vitro methods to expand the mechanistic coverage of the individual methods and to improve the predictivity with respect to the individual methods. Next slide. These approaches, which are based on the integration of data from different methods, are called defined approaches. And they are characterized by the use, the, by the use of a fixed data interpretation procedure applied to data generated with a fixed set of methods. So basically, they do not involve expert judgment in the derivation of the prediction, and therefore can be considered a sort of formalized decision-making approach. Next slide, please. In order to bring to the regulatory attention these approaches, and as a first step towards their standardization, the OECD has worked uh, over the past few years on the definition of reporting templates that allow a consistent description of these defined approaches. This template is designed along, along six main principles and is available in the OECD guidance document 255. The template, once developed, has been used to document a series of 12 case studies basically defined approaches for skin sensitization that are reported in an annex to guidance document 256. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of these 12 defined approaches or case studies in terms of the type of uh, uh, methods and information which are used within each of them. And the uh, um, um, key events uh, of the skin sensitization AOP they are covering. Uh, I will now hand over to Suzanne, who will guide us through two examples of defined approaches to learn mo more about them. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, so here we look at the same, uh, but, but just a little different uh, table of the list of defined approaches. So it's, uh, um, the, the order is um, different, that's why we have it again here. 
Um, so I will now walk you very briefly through two of the case studies. Um, one is addressing the hazard identification, and the second one we will briefly look at uh, is one that um, has been described to also assess the potency. Next slide, please. Um, so the first study uh, we will look at is the so-called two out of three approach um, for hazard identification. Um, so I guess amongst the list of, uh, of case studies that's the simple um, that has been proposed. In uh, this approach, um, three of the key events, so protein reactivity, keratinocyte activation, as well as the activation of dendritic cells, is addressed um, by OECD guideline methods. So that's the DEPRA for reactivity, lucent or keratinocyte for keratinocyte activation, and the H club for dendritic cell activation. So if all these um, three assays have been performed. Um, the results of uh, two of the three assays determine the overall result. Um, so it's also called the majority rule. So if two, two of the assays are positive, um, something would be predicted as sensitizer. If two are negative, um, we would come up with a determination of a non-sensitizer. Um, next slide, please. Um, in this slide, the predictive capacity um, of, of this approach, as published by Urbish et al. in 2015, is summarized. Um, so overall, there's a database that contains around 213 substances with LNNA data. Um, and this two out of three approach comes up with an accuracy of uh, 79%, a sensitivity of 82, and a specificity of 72%. For, um, from, for comparison, um, the DEPRA alone is, um, is, is a very good method. Uh, it has a 75% accuracy here. So accuracy is overall improved. And uh, as we're in general more interested in human sensitization than the mouse, um, we also have a subset of, of, of um, for a subset of the substances, human data is available. So for 114 substances, um, the, the data is available and we come up with an accuracy um, that's even better than for the local lymph node assay. Um, so accuracy, sensitivity and specificity, they're all 90% um, and that's better than the local lymph node assay um, compared to the human data for the same data set. Um, so that was the simple among the assay, um, but with this approach only the hazard is um, assessed currently. Next slide, please. Now we are looking at um, the case study submitted by um, Givondon, um, which is combining the data from a kinetic uh, DEPRA assay together with keratinosense data. And we're also looking at a potency assessment here. So actually, we, um, they, they combine um, the information of, of domain or global models um, for the potency prediction. So in the first step, um, they assess um, the hazard, so if the substance is a sensitizer or not. Um, they do that, um, or the prediction is sensitizer if either the keratinocent or um, the kinetic DEPRA come up with a positive result. Um, in the next step, they perform some um, structure activity relationship analysis and they um, to be able to, um, yeah, assign a substance to a mechanistic domain. So that's the domain or mechanism by which it's predicted to predict, um, bind to the protein and hence act as a sensitizer. And in a third step, the potency is predicted and um, there's three different uh, things they can do. Um, so for example, if they have, um, have a substance that's predicted um, to one of the mechanisms that, for which the um, training set is data rich, that's microacceptors, um, substances reacting by addition eliminations, epoxides and quinone methides and aldehydes. Um, they would do that with, via this more um, mechanistic domain. So they predict the uh, EC3 value for the LLNA. Um, if the substance is not within any of these domains, um, it can also be done via a global regression analysis. And um, the third thing that can be predicted is human potency. Next slide, please. So the um, most, um, most accurate predictions were um, achieved by a multivariate regression model. So that's uh, combining data from keratinocent assays, so that's uh, luciferase induction for the actual endpoint, 
Um, but also, as um, Sylvia has mentioned, the cytotoxicity is measured simultaneously, um, and this was also fed in the regression model. And the second uh, endpoint is peptide reactivity. So it's, uh, here it's not the DEPRA according to the OECD guideline, but it's an LCMS-based assay um, using a different peptide that has both the cysteine and lysine residues. And the K-max value of that assay is used in the regression model. And furthermore, um, the vapor pressure and the log P we, uh, value are um, included as um, SISCAM parameters. Um, as briefly mentioned before, we've, uh, the prediction is the most likely LLN A EC3 value, um, which then, of course, can be translated in the GHS category or as human potency values. The accuracy of that approach um, was, was rather good as well. Um, if you take into account that um, they're looking at far more classes, um, so the global model was had an accuracy of 71%, and uh, the data underlying that analysis was 244 um, LNA data. Um, then, of course, if you look at it in a more limited way, so on, on the, the, the domain models, the accuracy improves. Uh, so that was 75%, and um, less data was available for the human situation, um, so that's only 71 substances, and the accuracy was 61%. Um, next slide, please. So that was actually the two case studies that um, I, I intended to mention, and on this slide I briefly summarized some additional data on the kinetic um, uh, DEPRA, so um, as in the essay described by, by Andreas Natsch, uh, if you perform um, a reactivity essay uh, including both var variables, uh, reaction time and concentration, it gets more um, accurate because it covers the dynamic range, um, which the standard DEPRA does not because it's assessing a single reaction time and concentration. Um, and in the Kinetic deeper here. Um, we have a fluorescent readout, so it's actually improving the throughput in the asset because it's 96 well formed, but it's only possible to look at the cysteine peptide. And then the data set published by Waring et al. Um, the distinction was made between GHS category 1A and 1B, and um, with a data set of uh, 38 uh, local lymph node assay data, we had an accuracy of um, 92%. And um, for 14 of those substances, human data was available, and the accuracy was uh, still 93%. So that seems to be um, a very promising assay, and the RAIN trial is actually uh, planned to start f fairly soon. So with this, um, I think I'm, I'm to hand over back to Sylvia to uh, provide us some background on other ongoing OECD activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanne. So we have seen from uh, uh, the slides that Susanne presented that uh, these approaches uh, uh, have a pretty good predictive capacity, uh, both for binary classification and some of them also for potency prediction. And in some cases, they also appear to be even better than uh, the in vivo animal test uh, to predict responses in humans. So this potential of the defined approaches was discussed in the context of a workshop of the International Cooperation on Alternative Test Methods, where more than 20 regulatory authorities uh, worldwide, from US, European Union, Korea, Japan, China, Canada, and Brazil, were represented and attended. And there was a general consensus on the fact that 